because of that reason. Um, so my next question is for Samantha. Um, before you worked under a studio, I saw that you did some freelance work. I think it was 2013 or 2015? Uh, yeah, I did freelance for two years before uh, working in-house. Mm -hmm. um, what was the question again? No, uh, no sorry. <laughs> uh, did, I, I don't know why I say dates. Uh, did, do you recommend that young artists and maybe even young uh, game developers in general do freelance work before uh, the ability to work at a studio? Yeah, I mean it doesn't have to be uh, young or old or anyone, um, but you can. Um, I didn't go to college, so this kind of like environment is alien to me. Um, I just started doing freelance right out, out of high school just to start learning, and um, it kind of gave me that experience of teamwork and stuff. Like I learned how to like bring stuff into UK just because like one client needed it uh, to go in there and. I just I worked with like Unity and stuff too during that time, and when I interviewed for my first job, first in-house job, um, they don't really care about like oh you freelanced or like you worked on these projects. It's more so like do you know how to work with other people, do you know how to work in a team, and like how would you respond to this? Um, so it's really like if it's freelance or if it's something else, even if you're not paid for it, like. I've, People don't really care if you like made money or like what the project was. It was kind of like the experience you gained from it. Yeah. Can I add on to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, also, like freelancing is a really great way if you're like unsure of what specifically you want to do. It's a good way to test out um, different areas and see if you actually like doing that professionally. Like, if you want to see if you'd like to be an artist, you can do some freelance art stuff and maybe it turns out you're more into programming so you can try some freelance stuff with that. So yeah, um, especially being like at you know, entry level, you can kind of have more freedom to like, play around and try on different projects. Yeah, if I may add to that, I'm 200% what this just said. Uh, you are not going to know exactly what you like by, by, by the time you get out of university. You probably don't even know it now. You're just basically going through the methods of figuring out where you're going to go. Um, I did know what I liked. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's because you're a pro, man. <laughs> I wanted to make monsters. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those things, like, either from person to person, uh, you may not know. Uh, but when it comes to freelancing, you're going to get a lot of inter interpersonal skills. Uh, you're going to learn very quickly if you are a people person or if you are a team person or work on your own person. And those things are very important to learn and adapt because you need to figure out where you fit in. And if you can't handle a certain environment and you want to work in that environment, you're going to be pretty miserable very fast. So freelancing is a very nice, quick way to figure out, you know, is this what I want? Yeah, I know a lot of us have done game jams, so it honestly just kind of sounds like a game jam and you might get paid, which is awesome if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so when I was researching the panelists, and by that I mean stalking you guys on LinkedIn, um, I noticed that many of y'all are multi-talented, which is awesome. Um, Diz, I know that uh, you like to exercise your creative side by working on 2D art um, for some side personal projects. Um, and I know that a lot of students, which is Lou, I'm so glad that you said that, a lot of students don't know what they're doing. We just kind of are like, we like games, don't know specifically what we want to do or how we can help. Um, so how did you choose to, for lack of a better word, main engineering? Um, so kind of like that's really related to what we were just talking about. Um, when I was in QA, um, I was doing different freelance projects. I did concept art for a few people. I did programming stuff and I like really thought that I knew what I wanted and it turns out after doing those things I was like, no, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> like personally, like um, I thought I really wanted to be an artist and I love doing art um, and I did that all through like grade school but then when I did it in like a professional setting, it, to me personally it took the fun out of art and what makes art special to me and like I like when people would critique my art, it was really <laughs> hard not to take it personally and that is like a huge thing as you guys would know. Like. Um, you have to learn quick in the industry as you can never take that kind of stuff personally. But when I found when I did like programming stuff, it's like it's either right or it's wrong. And it's very just objective. And so it was easier for me to like get around the critique because I'm like, okay, you're right, it doesn't work. Let me go back and fix it rather than like a subjective like, 
oh, that doesn't look good, you know, you want to defend it. So personally, what worked for me was programming, <laughs> and so I stuck with that. And yeah, I'm happy with it. So, yeah. Nice. Um, and does keeping your creative brain engaged in this way help at all with your engineering job? Yeah, because um, I still have like that creative desire always in the back of my head, but I find that like knowing where to separate your hobbies and your professional life is really important because like I can still create art that's just for me and it doesn't have to answer to anybody it makes me happy and but engineer pays my bills so like, I, I draw a, a thick line there and I don't really try to cross it and I, I let art be my escape I guess <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next question is for James. Um, I saw that you have a BA in digital game in game programming. You've tutored in math and physics. You've done QA work, all in preparation to become the awesome producer that you are today. Um, was production always the end goal, or was it just like, oh shoot, I'm good at this? Like, well. It wasn't always the end goal. Uh, there's definitely time uh, when I was in college and getting my degree that it was like organization. Understanding the schedule was definitely interesting, but it never held like an appeal. It's like, oh, I'll I'll go into that as like a career. That's how I'll earn a paycheck. Um, and so after I graduated, I did go into QA and I spent some time there, uh, going from just like QA tester to senior to lead. <coughs> um, and then when I became lead, I was on the, the lead QA for Rising Storm Two Vietnam, which was kind of a different style project before all the other ones for Tripwire Interactive. Uh, where we had some internal development, but primarily most of the development was done uh, by an external developer uh, called Antimatter Games, who were based in Cornwall, England at the time. Um, and so it was a very small team. Like I was like the only QA tester for like a 64-player game. Um, and so there was a lot to kind of schedule in terms of, and understanding what was coming up between what we were kind of doing internally at Tripwire because we had to do a lot for that game because Vietnam was basically a mod of a mod of a base game. So the history of that is we had Red Orchestra 2, kind of a mod that we uh, launched with was Rising Storm 1, and then we had Rising Storm 2 Vietnam. Uh, and then when that came out, we had to make a lot of changes to just some basic elements for that game. We had to switch it over from a 32-bit EXE to a 64-bit EXE. We integrated all Weiss audio into it. Uh, we also made some drastic changes to performance for graphics and how we were rendering things. We supported DX11. Um, all a bunch of stuff for just like a small little internal element. Tripwire, uh, while at the same time uh, AMG was producing a lot of content for the release. So with that, I had to start kind of working heavily uh, with the producer both at Tripwire and at AMG to start understanding how I will be able to start effectively testing this without getting overwhelmed. And at the same time, since I'm the only one who's testing it, I'm not slowing everybody else down by like getting them bug rewards. Um, and so from that, I started working more and more on schedules, and I realized I kind of enjoyed it. I had a pretty good knack for it. Uh, I enjoyed working with uh, the producer at the time, uh, Mike Stone, who's now in publishing with Sedley Andre. Um, yep. Love you, Mike. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah, eventually uh, other people started to notice that I was trying to like working on a lot of organization, working on a lot of like scheduling elements, uh, working on scheduling elements that are just beyond like testing suites, like major parts for like how things should kind of come online for just like the overall schedule and development of the game. Uh, that definitely helped out, especially as we got closer to the launch, and I started to help out a bit more on how the post-release schedule might look like. Uh, and then eventually people were just like, you should just move over to production. They need people over there to be able to help out. Uh, Mike had to start working on another project, and they're like, well, they need to backfill Mike Stone's position, so you're already familiar with this project already, so why don't you just come on over, start working on this project from a, a production side instead of the QA. That's very cool. Yeah, that seems like a lot to manage as QA. Um, so, do you think that aspiring game developers should try to get good at something, or do you think that just kind of like general knowledge of everything and then you get 
higher and then figure out what you want to do from there is the best bet. Um, that's a good question. I'm not a big fan of like jack of all trades on the like you know jack of all trades master of none on the uh, but I do want to kind of pick up on a part that Andre <coughs> mentioned being a sponge on there. There was a lot of times in QA where I had to work with uh, I remember it was one program where I re really remember well on it. Uh, I had to pick up really quickly on the vocabulary that he would use. Uh, if you went to him and talked about like a bug that you found was something that he was working on and he didn't use quite the same kind of terms that he used for what he was working on, you know, he'd get pretty upset. Um, uh, no. Does that programmer still work here? <laughs> huh? Does that programmer still work? No, he, no, he does not work at Tripwire any, anymore. Uh, he left to another company, but he was he was a very good programmer. Uh, eventually, I was like the only one who was like assigned to test his stuff because I started to realize, oh, okay, this is how this person's personality is. Did this person go to Japan? Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, I went there. Um, and so that kind of came this part on there where the sponge element comes in. Uh, the best thing you could do is start when you're just in a room with somebody or with you in a team and you're not quite familiar with the subject or items that you're talking about. The cool thing with game development on there when you're working on these teams is the same words will come up again and again and again on it. So you just kind of have to kind of sit there, learn how to listen, remember what they're talking about, and eventually you kind of start getting it. You know, it's like uh, you fake it until you are it. Um, and so even though you don't have to be like an expert on there, like for example, I work with sometimes with environment artists, like I wouldn't be able to do a lot of the stuff that they do. I wouldn't be able to go in and take all the textures and turn it into a material that they need to apply to their assets. But at the same time, on there, I've been in enough meetings with them and been able to absorb what they're talking about, understand the workflow that they're doing, that I could go into the conversation with them, help them start planning on what they need to be able to do for the project. Cool. All right, on to our next multi-talented panelist, Lou. <laughs> Some of your specialties are uh, illustration, concept art, and sculpting. How is being a well-rounded artist in this way important to your job as an external art coordinator? As an actual art coordinator, uh, just like James said, uh, touched upon being familiar with the medium that your contractors are working in is super, super beneficial. Uh, being able to understand what how the process works and what needs to be done to put to the process to complete is super important because it helps coordinate everything and actually get things on time, online, in the order that you need to get. Um, it also helps you feel more invested in the product that is being developed, and you're able to con you're able to contribute as a person. Nice. Um, so do you think that like aspiring game artists should stay involved in these physical arts past just like necessary prereqs to get to the graphic design classes? I would actually say do what you're passionate about, in all honesty. Um, art is a media that just keeps changing every single decade. Like, there's no real like set thing that, hey, you need to be in pencil, and you need to know all about pencils and graphics and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> what I think is more important is that you find the type of art that you're really interested in, and you stick to it. Because if you get really good at that, people will notice. And if you can keep skill sets sharp in other areas too, awesome. But at the end of the day, it's like James said, we talk about all trades. If you're not passionate about it, if you don't have any interest in it, um, you're not going to get good at it. I'm sorry. But that's just, you can, <laughs> you can lead a horse to water, right? So, so it's, I really encourage people to stick to what you're passionate with and it will bear fruit. It really will. Um, so don't necessarily think that you have to do traditional art just to be able to that in or something. Uh, if you're super interested in digital art and you're good at photo bashing, if you're good at putting things together in that way, stick to it. You know, people will notice it. Thank you. I, I really like that. It's very, it's very uplifting. Um, so what are some of your 
next question is for Kurt, who yeah. I think has more hours in the day than I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have so much going on from founding your own studio, you've made your own programming language. Um, something that students st often struggle with is balancing all of our things, like classes, clubs, social life, um, gaming with friends, which I guess is social life as well. So, so you have to figure out how to work eight hours of gaming in a day. <laughs> How do you balance all of your different endeavors while maintaining your job? Um, this job is so cool. I mean, everything about it, it, it that, that's what I want to open with. Um, I love this stuff. I'm always interested in the next neat thing. How do I balance it? I, 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 I'm always looking at something else. Like, wow, that, how about this? Why do I get into VR? That's cool, let's do that. One thing that I find about game development, and I, I'm including everything, art, production, QA, everything, What's one thing you hear in common up here? I know what I've heard. I tried this, I tried that, I did this, I did that. It's all different things, not necessarily related. I used to work with a, with a UI designer in uh, Vegas, and every weekend he'd go snowboard. You think, is that the kind of thing that a, that a programmer does? Well, evidently. <laughs> it draws the kind of people that do crazy, weird stuff because we think it's cool. And you find the time, you make the time. You, I guarantee, if you had someone that said, I can't find the time to do this, I'm going to follow that person around for a day. <laughs> okay, see what you're doing right now? Are you doing nothing? You could be out doing this. You know, it's, it's not, if you really love it, you'll do it. Guess what you're doing all day? You're doing what you like. You're doing what you love. Um, yeah, I invented a computer language because I needed it to do something that no other language did, and it didn't work, so I, I made another one. you got to update the LinkedIn. Not because I wanted to invent a rounder wheel, because I thought it would be neat to do. I learned more doing that. You should see the smoking crater of the first five languages I tried to create. Oh, I, <laughs> embarrassing. I, I only bring it up to say you're going to fail a lot. I know I did. Um, you were asking me how I find out time of the day to do this stuff. Uh, um, I don't sleep very much. I, I know that sounds flippant. I really don't. I'm usually up till three or four in the morning. I get up at like seven. I have three kids. I'm married. I, I know. I know. It sounds crazy. I don't know how I do it. If I knew the magic formula, I'd tell you. It involves coffee. Uh, I, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm working during the day. I get that work done. And then I'm family guy until about, not family guy. A family guy <laughs> until, uh, until uh, around nine or ten o'clock when my wife goes to bed. She's a preschool teacher. She needs to get up early, and then now, now that's my time. I go downstairs and I work in the basement in my workshop doing whatever. I mean, yesterday I was building a server. Today I'm working. At, I'm going to become a commercial drone pilot. That is so much fun. Um, the FAA Part 107. It's, it's a lot of study. Uh, it, I wish I had a short answer for you. Just look at what you're doing at any given time when you're doing nothing and realize that's the time I do something else. It makes me sound like some kind of crazy perpetual motion machine. Um, not, not really, I just love so much different stuff. No, yeah, it makes sense when your work is play, that yeah. you play is work. And yeah. You like to play. That was the only thing I was gonna add to that. It's like, once again, if you're passionate about it, yeah. it's gonna pay for itself. Yeah. You gotta stay. Kurt obviously has tons of them. <laughs> I could go on. You got to. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I love talking about this stuff and about what uh, how, and, and how you get into it. And that's what you're here for. Is how do I get in? How do you get here? Yeah. I, I've been there. And I wanted to be here, and I'm here now. It's awesome. You you want to be here? <laughs> and, and it's it's the secret. It's not hard. The thing I wish I'd known before I started didn't ask me, but I had an answer, and that was how easy this is. I, it's not easy to do. It's hard to do. It's easy if you love it. You get into it, you do it, you do it, and then you, you, you get a job doing what you love. It's, you go into an interview, it's obvious. I can tell you within 30 seconds of interviewing everyone, we're going to hire them, we're probably going to hire them, or we're definitely not. That's, that's the direction you go, and it, it's, it's passion, 100%. Show me what you've done. You can program games, show me the ones you program. Oh, I've got this level, okay, you're done. <laughs> Here's the five games I work. None of them really work, but these kind of, hey, that's interesting. The follow up to that that wasn't on your follow up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, but just personal question, I'm sure it's helpful for everybody else, which is four hours of sleep, your work is play. Yeah. How do you avoid burnout? Do you just not get burnout? Um I had an answer for that ten years ago. <laughs> I used to work on 14th Street and I lived in Kennesaw. I did that for two years. I did that commute and what I would do is I would do all of my mental work in the car while I was driving. Um, 
I avoid burnout because I love, I really love to, I don't have to convince myself, oh, I love this, I love this. I really, <laughs> I really do. Um, I find challenges at work, puzzles and games. I love games and challenges. Everything to me is a challenge. Um, how do I make this better? How do I go faster? This is good, but how can I make it better? That it really interests me. And everything, I'll, I'll, I'll see a traffic light and think, how could that traffic light be better with this traffic light? <laughs> you, know, you find the challenges, they're there. You know, it's just, make it different. Yeah, of course, I'd throw out doing the same thing every day. Who cares? Make it different. That, that definitely makes sense. Thank you for that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Work is play. It just sounds like I'm talking here. Um, okay. They know me, by the way. This is not unusual. <laughs> Wait, that's not unusual. Yeah. This. Um, <laughs> that, I, that I talk too much. Um, I feel Sorry. Don't worry. It's, all it's okay. Good. Me too. I was waiting so patiently for you. <laughs> um, my next question is for Emily. Which, if y'all didn't know, Emily is a former Panther. Woo! Um, okay, and when you were a Panther, and you kind of briefly mentioned it, uh, you studied biochemistry, which is not one of the three game majors that we have. Um, so, and I know that there's many Panthers who I both in this room and outside of this room. They're they're phasing out one that I'm in. Someone else do it how you're in. They kicked me out. Yeah, I just have my advisor. Anyways, um, how how do you have any advice for uh, your fellow Panthers who might be in the same spot as you, where they're not in one of these game majors, but they do want to work in the game industry? So my life is pretty hodgepodge. Um, like Lou said, connections are extremely important. That's the only reason I have this job. Um, I went to college. I wanted to go into art. I told myself I would never get a job or make money doing that because it's a completely saturated industry. Um, I did like art circus modeling as a hobby, and I dropped that when I went to college. I was pretty miserable through my major. Uh, I bartended to pay for college, miserable doing that. And like as a Hail Mary, put out a bunch of applications to game studios because I'm like, well, that would be completely different. That would be like more fun. Uh, managed to get an interview, somehow did well with that. But like honestly, connections are extremely important. Network as often as you can. Like meet people, talk to people, like learn from other people. If I didn't know Tom, one of our producers, I wouldn't have this job. And. Um, it doesn't really matter what background you come from, you can get a job in the industry. As long as you keep putting yourself out there and you talk to people and you're constantly learning. Like I came, I did a, a tech support job before I got hired at Tripwire and I think that's what helped me because I was able to learn. It was basically Jira, that's what we use for our ticketing system. So it was like a proto Jira and the fact that I knew how to use that helped me get that job. Jira's portable, but it's very important. <laughs> Um, do you have any like networking tips? Uh, I creeped around on LinkedIn a lot before I got hired. Oh. Like I was hitting up a lot of people who worked at Tripwire, like trying to learn more about them, so I would be able to like have a good interview, and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so stalking. Yeah, basically. So, <laughs> so to that, it's kind of amazing on there that sometimes to get to get in, all it requires is to know one person. Yeah. Because I had the same thing as well. Like I was going through like my portfolio show when I was graduating on it, and somebody else who was in the same class as I was, uh, like it was like a downtime. I was talking with her, and like her boyfriend was there, and I started talking to him, and he was like, "Oh, how are you gonna like pay off your student debt?" I'm like. Uh, I guess I'm gonna have to go into mail stripping and we started joking. <laughs> like he was like a bunch of random kind of bullshit in the conversation on it, um, and he started talking about how uh, he was doing QA testing at Tripwire. They recently lost a tester. I mean, I think that's when Aaron moved over to Environment. Uh, and he's like, yeah, if you want a job, just send me your your resume. I'm like, oh, okay. I mean. The part where I had to pay off my student loans was legit, yeah. um, no matter what which direction I took. Uh, but eventually, it was like, yeah, it was like the connection that I had on it. I sent in my resume. They went over to the QA manager at the time, and I went in, and that, yeah, the it's, rest is history. It's yeah. so cliche, but it really is. If you can make those connections, and like Lou said, never burn bridges because it's such, it's like an incestuous. Uh, industry. Like my partner works in concept art. He worked here. He's worked with so many other studios. I've had people 
like some of my coworkers have worked together at other studios and they came over to Tripwire together and it's like you need to make those connections. Those are like it doesn't matter how good you are, if you don't know somebody and you can't show that to people, it doesn't mean anything. Like you need to know people. I got a little bit of a contrasting story. Yeah. I didn't know the first my first day on the job was my first time meeting other game devs. How uh -huh. did you get in? <laughs> <laughs> just the well, that's the thing. I didn't know anyone. I just shut myself in my room for like two years, just making models and freelancing. And the people I was freelancing for, there were a lot of like a lot of stuff outside of game dev, but they were using game engines. Um, but they weren't actually like I don't know any of them. Nowadays, I put my work on ArtStation, and it was on the Trinity Pro. Oh, shoot. And then uh, my first employer just like reached out through there. And I was like, I've never spoken to you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had my first day at work, and I was like, I've never met other people who 3D model before. So it was really weird. <laughs> um, so I didn't know anyone, but that is still very good advice. But um, I just put my work out there. Yeah. Yeah. So the takeaway well, the here is be out. awesome at it. Yeah, be awesome at it. So they're coming to like clear up the connection scene because I was actually part of the interview panel that interviewed you. I was so scared. I was <laughs> you look <table>. scared. <laughs> but so like, like Sam said, like there's kind of two sides of it. Your work either has to speak for itself through like tons of dedication and time. Mm -hmm. Like you lock yourself away for years just working on your cloud. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but then food. on the other side, like um, when we did hear that you had a connection, it wasn't immediately like, oh, she knows somebody, she's a shoe in Like the, the only thing that the connection helps for is that they know what kind of person you are and that you are a good fit for the team and that you do have the potential to be a good team member. Yeah. Because, I mean, Tom probably doesn't recommend every person he meets. He meets the ones that have the potential, that show the drive, that have something to speak for it. And we could clearly see that. Whereas some people, like, they did have a connection at the company and they were in immediate no. Um, even though they didn't have any experience either, they just didn't seem to care. And they didn't show that they ever cared to like research anything outside of their work hours or like spend any of their time or passion on this. And we could already see like, mm, he'll probably quit in like a year. But like with someone like you, even though you didn't have experience, we could see that like you were already interested in games and you had that potential to move forward. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say too, like even like getting into the, you're already in the industry. Um, the How I ended up at Tripwire, um, I was working at Amazon Game Studio in San Diego with Andrew Deering, um, and he's one of the sound designers. And when I worked at Amazon, I would always pick his brain because he had a cool job. I was like, I want to learn about sound and all of that. And so when he moved to Georgia, and got a job at Tripwire, he would hit me up and he would say, hey, we're, we're hiring, you know, for a QA tester. And I was like, man, I'm a lead right now, so cool, hit me up if something comes up later. So he would always just hit me up. And, uh, and then he finally um, hit me up, you know, a couple years ago and said that Tripwire Publishing was looking for a QA manager. And that's where I was trying to get at. Um, and so, like, we had worked with each other for years at that point, but um, you know, it just goes back to um, being a sponge and, and you know, being a collaborative person um, and not sort of burning any bridges. Um, just being a supportive, um, you know, real person. And you know, sometimes, like you said, the industry is small. Those people will come back around mm -hmm. in your career at some point. I have a very small thing to add. Um, just be someone you want to work with. Yeah, it's that's huge. That, that one's pretty straightforward. It, yeah. it correlates to a lot of what they're saying. A lot of times, that matters more than your resume. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. if you are, if you're in an interview and they can see, like, that is not someone I want to work for. They don't care how much experience you have. Yeah. Like, it's a no. Yeah. Um, Kim's just got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, well that, thank you guys for uh, giving a lot of different uh, nuance on that. Very, very helpful information. Um, so if y'all haven't noticed, we are very fortunate to have a lot of different skill sets on our panel. Um, so I wanted to get a bit into those. Um, so starting with Samantha, um, 
Creating uh, characters that are aquatic versus more like human-like. So it's was exactly that the same. Was it, was it challenging? I was gonna say it's like easy mode. Oh. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, it's like they're just they're just like fish. Where did you get the aquarium? There's an aquarium. No, did you go? <laughs> yeah, like three times on the project. Uh, no, it's like super, it was like super easy because uh, there's not like, oh, how many, is this enough fins? Is this not enough fins? <laughs> it's like, nope, this fin on each side, one on top. Like, it was really easy. The hard part was I had never worked uh, in a real engine before. Uh, well, I guess I had done some UDK, but like Unreal 4, um, that was like a big draw for the project for me because I came from a I came from uh, working on an MMO with a proprietary engine. That was like grounded mode, and uh, <laughs> uh, so it was. It was the uh, just the process was the challenge, but the, the actual doing the art itself. Yeah, it was like I wish that that maniator had been like my first project, just art wise. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not really like uh, in general if you're looking for. Like, Art uh, related field. Um, it's not so much like the, it's not always like the subject, it's just like, do you have, like, can you do this? Because there's like interns that can really screw up a fish uh, if they don't have the skill. Uh, yeah, just kind of like, do you, have the, do you have the skill? We'll teach you how to like use the tools or make the kind of creatures that we want. Um, was it, is it, you said it was kind of easy. Was it easier because it's less? Like, humans know what humans look like, but we don't know what a fish and shark is going to look like. Is that well, that's, why it was easier? That's, that's easier because I could, like, uh, I think one of the sharks had four gills at one point, and uh, nobody knew because you don't know. How many, anyone know how many gills a shark has? Five, six, three. Oh, seven. Five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, people may or may not know, or as you know exactly, like, the nose is, like, yeah. Doesn't have all the muscles and stuff. She um, won a trivia contest because of this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, someone fought me on that answer. Yeah, I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't have five gills, it has ten. <laughs> but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not when you're mirroring you know, three miles. Yeah, I only had to sculpt five. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned going to the Georgia Aquarium, which I wouldn't have thought of uh, as like a part of your workflow. Is what we is there for for work? What does your workflow look like when designing characters in general? Are you always going for like live references like that? Oh yeah. Um, well, I guess um, to be more careful with it, uh, we're not designing the characters. Um, someone else on the concept team designs them, okay. but even then, they get a they get a a writer will write a a doc for that's like the beginnings of the character design, and the concept artist will actually design it based on the document. And then I basically have to get it and be like, okay, well, like this part of the character is very loosely drawn, so I, have, I need to find some reference, and sometimes I have to ask the concept artist, like, is this the kind of shirt you were trying to go for, or is this like the kind of anatomy you were looking at? Um, and I basically have to make sure like the anatomy's right, um, and the surfaces are correct. That's, that's a lot of what it is, is like um, gathering a lot of real world reference or uh, creative inspiration reference and trying to piece it in together into something believable and that like fits the art style. Okay, so you work kind of hand in hand with the concept team? Yeah, that and also like um, animation team, like uh, the character has to be built in a certain pose and in order to animate properly and even like the topology of the low poly has to be done a certain way sometimes to like be able to chop limbs off and stuff. Like, <laughs> oh, we look at a lot of like gross stuff at work. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like there's a lot of stuff in the low poly that has to be right. Um, tech art as well. Like I'm always asking them questions. Like the the game has to actually run, so I can't put like a million materials on one thing. So that's that's a whole process. And then sometimes there would be like 
a mesh that has to be underneath the mesh that has to be revealed because a designer designed a uh, like a critical fit zone underneath. Um, so really, like everyone, even sometimes the sound designer will send me audio from uh, like the voice actress that they hired or whatever. Um, so all kinds of teams, I have to like kind of like talk to a lot of people and make sure the model does or satisfies the uh, the needs for a bunch of different teams. Yeah. That's, I, I am not in that world at all, so that was very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, next question for James. Um, you specialize in a bunch of different, or er, well, not two, you specialize in different production methodologies, such as Scrum and Agile. First, what is the difference between uh, between those two, there's not too much of a difference on it. Uh, right now, like overall, those are two going to be like the buzzwords that you hear in terms of trying to schedule a project. Um, Scrum is kind of underneath uh, Agile, so Agile is kind of an umbrella term for project management. Scrum is kind of uh, a method on how you develop the project uh, from beginning to end. Uh, and some of this difference differs from various other type of methodologies. Uh, primarily, like you probably just have like agile and waterfall, and very much like the different ones. Uh, so waterfall is very much like you know what you want to do, and you say, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to change it. We know everything that needs to be involved. We from that are able to start getting a, a start date and an end date, and you just go. Uh, Agile tries to take in a, a different approach on there where you're able to set different type of timelines or a certain type of amount of time to be able to go through a process uh, and especially with Scrum on it, you go through that process, you find out how well it worked, you take the notes, you apply it to if you need to iterate on it further or if it's good then you just kind of go on to the next item. Um, to kind of go along with that, like on these methodologies, you could go online right now and get like Google one of them, and you'll get tons of information about it on it. Uh, one thing that you do kind of have to look for is the task tracking software that you're using. Uh, I mean, overall, like the big one on there is Jira, but if uh, it, it's not the best on there, it's but people will use it because of how robust it can be on there. You have connection to Confluence. There's a lot of different services that come along with it, but of course, with that. It also has a pretty nice price tag to it. Uh, it does have add-ons, but that also comes with a nice price tag to it because you're paying for like per user. Most of those add-ons are like, okay, well, it's X amount of money per month, but it's also X amount of money per month per user. So you get into like this huge kind of budgeting issue uh, with that. But there's still other ones like, I mean, you can even just use Trello, Google Sheets on it, but in the end, one of the things you do have to do is determine which type of tracking software you want to use and how well that's going to actually be used by the people who are going to do the tasks on it. You can go out and get kind of like being like a, a scrum master certificate, all that stuff, choose the most complicated version of something to implement into JIRA on it, but if you start handing out the tasks and people are like, I don't know what this means on it, or I don't know how to be able to view what my next task will be, uh, you're kind of doesn't matter what methodology you're using, your project isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, so having the familiarity with like various types of uh, task tracking software on it uh, is for me something that like when I was hearing about production methodol methodologies in school, that's not something that was mentioned a lot. It was usually about these different principles and how they differ from each other. But nobody said, well, Jira is really great for this one but also it gets really complicated really quickly. Uh, and nobody really dove, dove into how important it is for making sure the tasks are clear for the developers to work on. And then also sometimes uh, the developer will want to be able to see something about their tasks that might not always align well with certain methodologies. Uh, so Jira is really heavy on Scrum. I think I can't remember exactly what we were trying to do, but I think it was for one of our environment art teams. Um, they came up with a really good process for like how we were going to track tasks, how they were going to have visibility on it, and I started setting it up, and it wasn't working. I was like, all right, what the hell's going on? Uh, so usually, thankfully, with Jira, since it's pretty popular, you're going to find tons of forum posts. And thankfully, a lot of people were talking about trying to do the exact same thing that I was trying to do. 
uh, but unfortunately it went up went against uh, a scrum uh, methodology. So you couldn't do it on it. And that's like one of the things you kind of have to balance out uh, sometimes on it. So yeah, there are these methodologies, they have rule sets to them, uh, but sometimes for developers, they're like, I don't care. I just need the task, and I just need to know what I'm going to be doing next. Uh, and so you do kind of have to balance that out between what are these methodologies, what are these tax tracking software, uh, services that try to follow these as best as possible, and at the same time making sure that you're giving good tasks for people to work on. So you figure this all out beforehand, or is it kind of like you get a weekend and nobody knows what they're doing? Um, you, you figure out beforehand on there where you at least kind of know uh, that you're going to be able to have people do work, that people aren't just going to be sitting around on it. And through that, uh, you start getting kind of feedback on things. So one part on for Scrum is kind of like doing retrospectives. So at a certain part at a milestone or at some element during the project development, you'll meet with your teams on there and start kind of asking them questions about like uh, what went wrong, what went right, what do we need to start doing to be able to improve processes. Uh, and since tasks are driving a lot of what they're doing, um, you'll always get kind of feedback if that's not going well for them. Uh, if they, they don't understand what the task is, they're going to let you know. If they don't understand what their next task is going to be, they're going to let you know, and they're going to have feedback on it. So you try to uh, absorb that feedback, find out the best way to implement it within these restrictions that you might have for the methodology, or just the tax tracking software that you're utilizing uh, to get the balance of uh, both. Um, my next question is for Diz. Um, you mentioned the need to stay on top of a uh, different technology that's evolving um, almost as quickly as we can get our hands on it. So do you, how do you find success with that? Um, yeah, so that was like probably the most shocking thing coming into my specific position um, because like we're always on the cutting edge of like every Thing that we can get our hands on, like we had the PS5 way before anybody knew that it what it looked like or anything about it. Um, so, for like, luckily, when you get in the industry, you'll find that um, a lot of resources are made available to you before like anyone else. So, for instance, for like Unreal Engine, um, we have uh, developers have UDN, which is Unreal Developer Network where we can log in and ask questions privately and have like the Epic team um, personally respond to us. Whereas most people that aren't um, part of the studio don't have access to that a lot of the times. Or I'm not sure if they have access. Well, they can ask questions. <laughs> yeah, so there's like a public facing um, forum and then a private one where um, other studios can ask on. So like a lot of the times I'll have to um, dig into those forums and just kind of ask the um, like Epic directly. Um, or like for instance, um, I was doing some stuff on the Switch, uh, on Switch SDK before like there was any documentation on it. So a lot of it was just like getting in the weeds and like reading through the code and figuring out like, okay, how are they handling this? And a lot of times it's, um, it can't do exactly what we want it to yet because it hasn't been out that long. Well, usually so, the answer is, as soon as Fortnite needs it, we'll get it to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so uh, a lot of times for like the different platforms like Switch or PS5, when there's not really documentation available online yet, um, I just have to dig in, get my hands dirty, look at the API and just kind of uh, a lot of times I have to make up my own solutions, like for Switch, like the profiling stuff, like to do benchmarks on um, graphics performance and stuff, wasn't quite there yet um, to be able to like export uh, the, the data from that. I'm trying not to get too technical, <laughs> but basically we needed to uh, run tests on the Switch every night and get that data from the switch onto the computer every night and normally like on Xbox or PlayStation that's really easy but switch is like specifically so like Nintendo keeps their stuff down lock so you can't just send a file over 
um, you have to physically get that SD card out of the switch and put it into your computer in order to get that data. <laughs> so like, um, because of that, I had to figure out a roundabout solution that just didn't exist yet for Switch. Um, so I basically had to make my own server, have it like in the game, send that data to the server, and like all that <laughs> stuff. So uh, yeah, a lot of times like it's just figuring out your own solution or talking to uh, the people that work at Nintendo or Sony directly. Um, so yeah. Uh, for me, like a big thing um, was learning how to just ask, because um, like when things are changing so rapidly, like the only way you can possibly know is just to talk to people and don't wait too long before you get to that point, um, or else you know you'll never get yourself done. So yeah, yeah. cool. Thank you. That, that I like the Nintendo. That makes sense for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so my next question I have for two different people. Um, same question for Kurt and Michael. Um, Michael, you said that you use C Sharp most of the time, and Kurt, despite the fact that Callisto, I, you said you have a new one, but we'll, right. we'll, okay, we'll go with the, that's the one that I did sure. really have been stocking on. That's similar to C++, yeah. um, but you'll still use C Sharp uh, when doing VR development for hearts on games. Um, and C Sharp and C++, especially, uh, if you know, you know. Uh, people have preferences between those two, and there are also two languages that um, are continually recommended for game devs to have down. Um, so, Michael, I think I know your preference, C sharp? Question mark? Yeah. Yeah, hands Why? down. Well, okay. So, well. <laughs> Strong preference for me is because like I work on my hobby stuff on the side, so like indie development, fast development speed is what I need, and like. I'm not going for cutting edge graphics, I don't need the most performant engine, and I really don't want to deal with all the BS that is C++ and Unreal. And so that is why C Sharp, all the way, 100%. Okay, so... I don't know your preference, so give us your preference, if you have one, and why? Um, I don't, and there's an important reason for that. Um, if you want to um, go from Atlanta to San Diego, do you take a car or a plane? <laughs> I moved across the country from San Diego. I drove to Atlanta. Just, I don't know if that helps. But it's, it's like that. It probably I did, hurts. I did two with two dogs. Okay. Oh, one dog. Yeah, my wife took the minivan. You're driving the truck. Um, okay, so it's, it's a bad example. It's a really slow plane or really fast car. The C++ and C Sharp are different. They're, they're two different things for different. C++ is a compiled language. It goes right down to the bare metal. It goes really fast. It also lets you blow things up with spectacular ability. <laughs> C Sharp is an interpreted language that is compiled when it's run. So it's almost as fast as C++ in the stuff you're actually going to be doing. But it's a different tool. Um, they're really code words. C Sharp is code for Unity, and C++ is code for Unreal. So when you say I'm programming in C Sharp, what you mean is I'm coding in Usually I'm coding in Unity. C++ is, well, I'm probably coding in Unreal game engine. Those are the two big game engines that are used. Unreal's used for the bigger projects because they release the source code. And studios like that. They say, give me the source code so that if something goes wrong, we can fix it. We don't have to wait for your Fortnite people to fix it out. <laughs> Unity does not. They don't give you the source code. There's some good reasons for that, but they're unimportant. The point is that because of that, if a new graphics card comes out and it's got a bug in it, we got to wait for Unity to fix it. We can't just go in there and fix it ourselves. So um, Unity is used for uh, mobile development. It's really good for that. C Sharp is really also good at um, you make a you make a change and it just runs because it can swap out the code inside. C++ you could do that. Unreal tries. Don't try to do that. It's just a way to watch your computer melt down. Um, so C Sharp, C++ and C Sharp, the good news is they're 90% the same. If you looked at them, a for loop, a while loop, they're all the same. They use the same stuff, they do the same things. It's important to understand what happens in C Sharp when you say, well, just make me a string. In C++, well, it's a little more complicated because you have to tell it how to do that, and you, I'm getting in the weeds, they're different. <laughs> um, I like using C++ for things it's good at. I like using C Sharp for things it's good at. C Sharp is good for 
Um, I want a language that's going to get something done quickly, and if something goes wrong, it'll tell me what went wrong. C++ is for when you have to use it, and it's going to go something really fast, and when it explodes, maybe you'll get a core dump that's useful, probably you won't. That's pretty much the answer. That you're right. I mean, there, there are different tools for different jobs. Like, I've, since working in Tripwire, I've used C Sharp, C++, Python, uh, like PowerShell files. It's really whatever whatever you need for that situation. But like, I still just can't get over how elegant C Sharp is. <laughs> and yeah, God, I hate saying that Microsoft did it. <laughs> and he's right about like uh, you know it's synonymous with Unity. But I wish they would update their C Sharp version because uh, right. there's reasons that, that they that they don't. But like I, I keep up to date on some of the stuff they do, but I just don't utilize it. So I do mostly in game development or game adjacent stuff. But like. Some of it looks really nice, and we need it, but they won't give it to us. It's a fair question. If I could use either, I would use C Sharp. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people on the team who made C Sharp. Sorry, I'm old. Um, they're really smart. It was really good. But am I supposed to stop talking now? No, no, you're good. Sorry. <laughs> there, this side is getting I'm outstanding. Yeah, they're just going to say this hands. Yeah. Um, Supply needs extreme, too. So, what, 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 is, what do people here think? Who, who, show of hands, who prefers C Sharp? Some background yes. on yeah, why I said. Yeah, it's us, right? Uh, <laughs> some background on why I said, uh, if you know, you know. Yeah. So the one, the, the two game majors that are not being phased out are game design, game development. Uh -huh. If you're game development, uh, you learn Unity C Sharp. If you're game design, you learn Unreal Blueprints. Hmm. So us trying to merge together right. is sometimes a little difficult because the design people love uh, Unreal and. Yeah. Under the hood, blue, Blueprint will generate C++ code and then compile it. Um, they, in your Unreal 4, they said, that's oh, going to be great. You will take all your Blueprints or return to C++ or it compiles it really fast. And that blew up in their face. It doesn't work. But Blueprint's fast enough to do what it does. As long as you don't do stuff every frame and you learn how to cache results, Blueprint works just fine. Um, C Sharp, there's actually Blueprint-like stuff in Unity, last I looked. Uh, there's a plugin for it. I, I know the guy who made that. And then they bought it from him. Um, <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Um, that uh, it, I like C sharp a lot because of. Uh, I mean, I give you technical reasons. The, the reflection is built in. The when it, when so something. Nice. What? It's so nice. I'm just I'm, every time. Um, <laughs> keep stating. Jit Jit compiling means that you can swap out modules without having to recompile. I love it. Uh, the, the module support is extremely good, and, and it always works when you call a module here. It works the same on all your platforms. Because they have a great stand. Yeah. Okay, I can I can go through reason why C++ is awesome too. Hate it. Hate it. Do you guys into recommend this student dev learn one over the other, or is just whatever you're comfortable with? And then um, to, like, here's the thing. You learn one, as I said, and I'll stick to this. You know, ninety percent of the other. You really do. Um, <laughs> algorithms and algorithm. Learn those. Um, I would say start with what you know. That's dumb. Um, <laughs> learn what you're comfortable with, whatever you're working on now, learn that. What? Um, I would say know what your scope is, because yeah. if you are not ever going to get into the weeds of like needing like complex custom memory management or like engine level stuff. The really fun stuff. Like if you're not Kurt level excited about that kind of stuff, <laughs> then just movie. don't waste your time because yeah. you will waste a lot of time and energy and it won't sink in and you won't grasp it and you won't make the games you want to make. Whereas C Sharp, if you have a game idea and you want it done fast and you don't care about that engine level stuff, just go with C Sharp and make it in Unity. Just because C++ and Unreal Engine sounds more impressive, if that's not the job you're going for, don't waste your time on that. Yeah, the more I'm thinking about this, C Sharp, <laughs> Unity, learn that, learn C++ if you have to, if you feel that there's a need. If you want to do something, you think it would be cool to learn how this works, go learn how it works. If C Sharp does your job, do that. Is what if you want to go in AAA, you should learn C++ and Unreal. If you're going to be a programmer in AAA, you need to learn C++. You don't need to, yeah, you don't need to really know it, but you shouldn't be scared if you see a template. Do you have your Yeah, because I'm a computer science major, and like, I'm also in the cybersecurity club. So like for cybersecurity, like learning one language is better than being a jack of all trades as. Mm -hmm. And so like I wanted to ask like 
is like that the opposite case for here for gaming? Like learning more languages would be even more beneficial? <coughs> Not really. No. 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 You're gonna you're gonna do most of your work in one particular language. It's gonna be C sharp or C plus plus or maybe J, uh, Java. JavaScript, depending. If you're doing a lot of online development, a lot of uh, applet stuff, you're going to see a lot of JavaScript. Um, you might have to write some Pythons once, once in a while. Um, I used to work at CCP. If anyone knows that studio, their Eve Online is entirely built in Python. So I have flashbacks when you say Python. I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you might see a Python script now and then. You won't see you won't see Perl or anything else. I mean, like I said, it's, it's, I believe it's a bit jaded. I've been doing it for a long time. They all start to run together. You show me a language in five minutes, I've got it because I've seen so many. It's not a special skill, it's just experience. C, uh, C sharp, C, and some other stuff is in the industry. Yeah, if you know that you want to do gameplay programming in the AAA industry, you do need to know C, Unreal Engine. That's like the standard now. But if you know that you are either unsure about being a programmer and you're okay with doing game design, or you are okay with working for an indie studio, and even a lot of AAA studios are switching over to Unity now. And some really impressive stuff is coming out for that. So oh yeah, name two. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of Team 17, haven't you? What? <laughs> Team 17 is a great deal. Exception yeah, that was very in depth on C sharp. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I usually no, no, have no. to like spark something, especially getting two people on that. So thank you guys for going in on that. You can always come back to that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure people will. Well, just a, to a, a final word, but um, um, <laughs> <laughs> avoid getting religious in anything. Um, don't love something so much that you would say this is the best and blind yourself to other things that work. The more you're in the industry, the more you realize everything kind of works. Do what you need to do, accept that there's two or three equally correct answers, and your team's going with this one. Don't be passive aggressive. So be adaptable is probably the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. don't be so passive don't be aggressive. <laughs> don't don't be married to anything. Okay, yeah. gotcha. No marriage, no religion. None. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, but that sounded terrible. It it call it message. No, it's, it's the old trope of like, don't be married to your work. If someone critiques it, and, or you have to switch gears or anything, you have to be adaptable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I spent the last uh, was eight, ten months working on a project that was dumped overnight, almost literally. And they said, uh, this is this is good, but we're going with something else. And you know what I said? I said, okay. <laughs> because, uh, adaptable. Because I learned lessons from it. I'll bring that work on to the next thing I do, and that's it was the right decision. Put yourself in their position. They had A and superior solution. I said, well, you're right, it is a superior solution. Let's go with that. Let's get to it. You know, Michael knows all about it. Here's what I'm talking about. So it, it happens. It really happens. I mean, it, it still stumbles a little bit, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> You'll learn. We also, it, it, it just things a little bit more because we transitioned from C sharp to C. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nail in the coffin. <laughs> Thank you again, guys. Um, very in depth. I'm sure that people would love to. Like, again, people would love to geek out with you. So if you guys were willing to say, I'm sure that there's people who want. Am to I talk willing about to talk that. more? <laughs> <laughs> um, my next question is for Andre. Um, so accessibility is something that people have become more and more aware of in the games industry. So much so that I think that it was even a criteria for best indie game at Southern Fried Gaming Expo this past summer. I think. Um, as a champion of diversity and accessibility in not just video games, but the spaces where games are made, um, obviously accessibility is very important, but why is it important in video games? Um, I think it, it's it's important um, because, you know, it, it's, you're, you're, if you're not intentionally thinking about like accessibility when you're when you're developing games, you're, you're unintentionally excluding a large amount of people um, and so um, you know games are, are for enjoyment um, a lot of people that don't even need accessible accessibility options use them uh, and um, you know it, it's one of the things that really got me thinking about accessibility I met someone who was a producer on a game we were working on and he couldn't play the game um, and that kind of struck me as like why why like this doesn't make sense and so from that point on, I felt like I was always going to have accessibility in mind, um, you know, throughout my career. Do you 
do you have any tips for young developers to, because um, I mean, we're still learning the basics, yes. so that's an awesome goal to get to. Is yeah. there anything that we should be considering when we're making uh, our level of games? Yeah, I think, um, you know, having a diverse group of people work on your game um, and, and thinking about the, the, the not only accessibility in, in making sure the game is playable for everyone, but also inclusive design. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to name games, but I, I've, I've played games where characters look like me. There's no hairstyles like that I would have. I want to hear a girl about you know what I mean? So, like, there's things that, like, are important to make the game not just playable, but feel like you're represented. So. I would say that there's groups out there, especially for accessibility, like Able Gamers is probably at the top of the list, um, to get people, different groups of people involved as you're making your game. Um, and they'll give you the feedback, you know, to, to help you ensure that your, you know, your game is accessible. And like I said, this room is very diverse. Um, so, you know, our studios are getting more diverse now. So um, don't be afraid to go talk to somebody if you're working on like art and ask them like, do you think this is a good representation of what we're trying to make? Um, because if everybody looks the same, like you're not going to get that. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and what was that you said? Uh, you said some community that would help with like playtesting. Able gamers. Able gamers. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good one. And games for change as well. Yeah. I have something to add to that. Uh, there's a type of testing that's actually rarely done in the industry, but it's really scary. And that's where you take a you install your game on a computer and then you have the tester go on it and you're not allowed to even interact with them. You watch them through a one-way mirror. And what's aching to see them not get past the main menu because they don't know where you put the start button. And you're not allowed to say, oh, just press that. Right, they walk away from the game and they leave. And it's important to do that, that, that and I'm segueing that into, um, you'll discover someone doesn't, you know, they're red, green, colorblind, and they can't play your game. And you say, well, well, that's unusual. It is. It's a minority, but it's a large minority, and you have to and you have to consider it. And it's something that someone who sees color wouldn't consider. Um, someone who doesn't have the use of their right hand or their left hand, or you know, can't turn their eyes. You, you, there's there's all kinds of disabilities with able gamers that people who are able-bodied don't consider. It's just not on our radar. And it, games are something that are supposed to be almost by definition inclusive. We want them to be inclusive. Not just because you know more people buy them. Yes, that's part of it, but because we all love it and we all want to experience it and share that with other people. That's that's the reason I'm doing it. So it, it's important to consider that and to get other points of view and not say I, I know what it's like to be colorblind. I can imagine. I can change the colors on a monitor. Like maybe, but get someone who is. You know, yeah. get 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 the tester. Yeah, I think you know, and and having those conversations early on in the development process is going to make it. Get, get more buy-in from people because you don't want to feel like it's a chore and then you don't and then you get into where you're just doing sort of the bare minimum um, so whether you're working in QA if you're a production if you're an artist you know and you have thoughts about accessibility as you're going through like bring those up with people um, that's the, that's a really important part don't be afraid to speak up about that and make sure it's known if you feel like the game isn't accessible um, and that gets the conversation going and like I said doing that early on it is really where you're going to get buy-in from the development team. Yeah, because if you tack it on, it shows. Yeah. That you, we made the game and then, oh, we painted it pink and now it's for girls. Yeah. I heard that once 10 years ago. It's awesome. <laughs> and it's like, no. <laughs> you have to, from the very beginning, if you don't make it like for colorblindness or this is an example I'm, I'm, I'm glomming onto because it came up once, um, it feels like you tacked it on and, they can, and, and, and it's obvious that you did. Like the accessibility menu. Communication is key, basically. Yeah. Make, make it in from the beginning. Consider it from the beginning. And reminding them, like, yes. you bring it up in the beginning. Yes. On it, but at the same time, those features may not be some of the first features that come online for a project. So mm -hmm. always constantly reminding about accessibility. Um, it will be important. And not only that, but the part about uh, how people will know if it's like, tacked on at the end on it, uh, the developers will also know that it's tacked on at the end and really hate having to do that and on top of yeah. everything else that they already built things on and then you want some type of system change to it. And like, well we already did this, we should have been doing this from the very beginning, you're now making this much more complicated and you're also not making it as like, a good example for the end user either. Just throw a task in Jira and tag it like every other day <laughs> <laughs> until like, it becomes 
becomes an annoyance for people. I'm like, I'm going to keep doing it until it's, you know, it gets done. To me, the most is Killing Floor 2 because it came out in 2016 and was continually updated for over half of a decade. What factors go into choosing to update a game rather than creating a sequel, and how, is this, how has the studio retained interest in the game for so long? So I can only answer this question to a certain point. Uh, I did the testing for Killing Floor 2 uh, up until pretty close to the release, and then I was moved over to the Vietnam Project. Uh, but I did have to do a bunch of post release support for RS2 Vietnam. Um, one of the big items on there is, uh, and this is going to be really business-like on it, uh, which some people you know, may not appreciate as being like the first opening statement. They want to hear about how people think the game is really cool and we're always going to make it forever because people love it. Uh, but one part is the return on investment on it. Uh, the amount of time and developer time that you're spending on the project for the updates you're going to be looking into tracking that. That's where from the production part, knowing how long people are working on the project, how tracking their hours, how long they're working on tasks. So you can properly determine, okay, when this update came out on it, like how many people came onto the game, how many people, uh, like how many hours were they on, did they purchase uh, anything from the marketplace, are they still purchasing kind of items on there, and is it enough to be able to sustain the development team for continuing on with updates on it? Uh, that's also along with what is needed overall for the, the, the company as well. Um, so eventually, like you could have maybe a successful game, you could have a successful post-launch schedule uh, with updates, but at the same time, that doesn't always completely defend you uh, because for eventually everybody knows that it is going to die down eventually. Uh, and so you might have to end it a little bit earlier to be able to help feed the next big project that's going to be able to take the company for five or seven years past that. Um, and so yeah, it, and it is um, kind of, the way I describe it sounds make it, make it sound a little brutal, cut and dry, but we do try to like balance it out between uh, keeping something on alive for the players as long as possible. Um, one of the things that Tripwire has specialized in, um, and we didn't do it so much for Manager, uh, is also <coughs> always supplying the user with an editor and allowing them to have mod support. Um, we did that really big for KF1, RO2, uh, the Rising Storm games, and also KF2. So that was something with uh, for our company on there has always been a big element on being able to, not only are we trying to provide good updates that the community will enjoy, they will enjoy playing the games and the updates that we do, but we also get them kind of engaged by like, hey, these are the tools, these are the assets on there that we were utilizing. We made this editor especially for the community on there to be able to generate their own content. And yeah, we do sometimes kind of survive off that content as well because we will release a server, People will be able to set up their own server, put their own custom maps on there, or maps that are just from the community. I mean, I think right now, for like Rising Storm Vietnam, like if you go on there, the servers that are up, they're probably almost all running community content on it. So it's right now, it's really a, a community curated game. Like if you go on to Steam and launch it up. Cool. I think that's a good point about yeah. allowing people to edit it as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of the people in KF2, myself very much included, were fans of the game. I, I came to the studio partially because I love the game. I have over 5,000 hours in KF2. And that's not because I was testing it. <laughs> we love the game too. So when we released it, we don't just make stuff because... The, the, the cynical thing is, if you keep buying it, we'll keep making it. Right? It's not just that. 
we, we say as long as we can make stuff that we ourselves enjoy, we make and we love and we love these cool game, uh, cool guns and new levels and new stuff, that we're going to we keep doing it because it's we can keep it fresh and fun. As long as we can keep doing that, it, it's certainly easier than making a new game. Right? So there, there is that aspect of it, but that is a large aspect of it. Yeah, I wanted to we're fans. That's basically, first of all, I'm so freaking happy we have both Kurt and James here because they answered this question beautifully, far, far better than I could have. Um, and that's basically it, right? The passion, the fact that we are very invested in the IP and the fans are very invested in the IP and it's like coming out with you where um, we feed off of each other in a weird way because, you know, the community comes up with something really cool and then we'll take that idea and then we'll spin it up further and release it and then you know, there's this collaborative effort that is really, really fun. Sometimes we'll take the person who made it. <laughs> so for real. Like, We've hired several LDs. Yeah, like that, like, seriously, because that passion, like we see it. Like if you make a badass level for your favorite game, the developers are going to pay attention to it and they're going to see it. And they're going to be like, that is really freaking cool. They spent their hours on that just for fun. And we hired a bunch of people Dude, Nick, yeah, and, because uh, of their passion. And Mike, like, we know. Another one. Yeah, so it's just like, that's also a, a large part of the reason why the IP has been around for so long is because not just the developers are passionate about it, but the community too. And we think that's very important. Yeah, we do hold, hold like a lot of mappy contests yeah. mm -hmm. from KF2, Killing for one uh, We get our amazing ones. Yes. A bunch of those games, like, so we always try to drive that type of uh, comedian young there where they are map modders mm -hmm. on it and we're like, yeah, okay, these are definitely people who are like really showing off their talent. Mm -hmm. We'll create it to a contest and then we're like, okay, the top three, like we'll bring your game, we'll make the map official, you could actually get your name in the credits, your name will also be there at the, the launch screen as the map loads and so yeah. you start to get that, that new variety. I mean, also we pay too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No, it, a, a fun, happy example is uh, we had a video creator, uh, Otto, uh, I don't know, I'm probably butchering his name. Octobo? Tiago? Yeah, his yeah, yeah. usual yeah, name yeah. is like Doctobo or something. Dr. Octavo. Yeah. But, <laughs> he did this amazing but, video. Uh, he's, an, he's an amazing individual from, uh, that we've worked in for a long time. He's a long time K fan. And he did uh, videos for fun, like for the community, for a long, long time. And we kept looking at him, and we're like, that is really cool, what you just created. And we reached out to him, and now he's part of our team, and actually does a lot of our trailer work, if not the majority of it. Because he was passionate, and he is really, really into it. And he, we couldn't ignore it. So it's like, I really, I keep hammering about this, but if you get a drive, you can do it. Like, you just keep at it. Does anybody, because that was a good question, does anybody have anything else that they want to add to that? Because that was the last big boy question. Now I have a small boy question for everybody. <laughs> All right, small boy question time. Um, okay, so like I've said a bunch of times, uh, we're very fortunate to be learning from a wide array of not only industry experience, but skill levels, or not skill levels, skill sets. Um, so I have a final question for everybody on the panel. I'll start with left to right, Kurt. Um, what is a quick piece of advice that you would give to students who are looking to work in the game industry, whether that be um, uh, just some expectations, a list of things that we should be doing, or maybe just like loving words? Um, or what was the last thing? Loving words. Loving that's words. Because that's what I thought you said. <laughs> um, I thought you mispronounced run and fear. Um, so, what I would say is, uh, first of all, um, do whatever it is you're doing, um, because game, you, you think game design is game design, and game design is this, it's all the other things you do too. I said at the beginning, I started as a mechanical engineer, because they made me pick, right? I love doing all kinds of different things, and I love programming as a hobby, and I didn't realize it could be a career, and I was like, you can do this for a living? Well, okay, cool, I'll do that. You know, forget HVAC. And working on it, well, okay, I do that in my spare time working on engines, but the, the, the best game designers, uh, game programmers I've worked with, and I've had the privilege to work with some amazing people um, of, all, of all different uh, skill levels and talents, <laughs> um, uh, is that they, the best ones always do something else. They always have some weird hobby, and sometimes several. Uh, this one happens to be, like, Bill happens to be a chess master. 
really? Okay, well, that's not too far off. And, and this guy over here does parasailing. It's a, not going to get someone else. Um, that all of these other interests are what feed into being a good game developer. Because making games is all about making those experiences as a game. That's what a game is. It's taking you away from where you are and putting you into a world that you want to be. Well, how do you know that unless you've been there, unless you've lived, unless you've tried it? And I, I know very few people here probably landed on Mars, but <laughs> you have to do that kind of thing. You have, you have to do similar experiences and research and understanding to bring that kind of experience to someone that's plausible and go, oh, this really is what it's like. And that's, that, that would be my advice is have lots of interests and pursue them. Don't worry. They'll, they'll matter. They, they, they'll, they'll come up, especially in an interview. When you find out that, oh, you're a glider pilot? That sounds interesting, and you talk about that. You know. um, as far as uh, loving words, um, it's probably harder than you think, and it's probably easier than you think at the same time. Um, it's a lot of work. I know I make it sound like, oh, this is great, just do this. It, 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 there's those 32-hour debug sessions where you're, you're freebasing caffeine, and you just, what is wrong? And especially as a programmer, why doesn't this work? Okay, why does it work now? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's just, and there's this really viral video, it's got like 10 billion views on it. I showed it to my son, it's so true. It's like what people think programmers do. And it's just, you know, oh, super tech, he doesn't talk about like a matrix guy. What we actually do, cut error, paste into Google. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a lot, that is totally true. When I come up with an error, I take out the most salient text I can think of, that's exactly what I do, boom. And I get three or four clues about people who've encountered this in the past. So. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. Yes, the pros do it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael. Uh, setting expectation, whatever, whatever vibe you want to go with. Um, well, can I hear the repeat of the question? Yeah, for sure. A lot, so. uh, oh, piece sorry. Of advice you would give to students looking to work in the game industry, whether that be setting expectations, list of things that we should be doing, or loving words. So it, it wasn't that you talked too much. It's that it's hard to remember all. Oh, it's that I talked too much. <laughs> uh, there's a couple times. <laughs> um, I mean, dedicate time to your craft. I mean, like when I was in college, especially when I wasn't in a relationship, like so many of my hours went to just programming stupid stuff. They didn't turn into games because I have a habit of not doing that, but so many cool little tech demos. Um, I don't know, but like example, I actually I think this one was from high school, but I made like a Super Mario Galaxy type platformer type thing. Um, and especially if you're if you are doing like indie dev or you're just trying to figure out like the kind of stuff that you want to do, wear a lot of hats because that's kind of how you figure out what you want to do. And if if you're doing indie development, like that's sometimes the end goal. But lately, I've been doing um, like I just it's not even exactly like game development, but. I want to make lore for a world because I want to make like a small open world with some history like factions and magic systems. It is so hard to just sit there and write, just come up with ideas, but um, dedicate time to your craft, uh, I would think is my ultimate goal. And honestly about networking, I, I think you guys, so you told me how you guys here work on projects together. That's actually really good and I mean I was an officer of a similar S club. Never thought of that. We did we did game jams, but like one game jam or two game jams a year sort of thing. But whole semester long, that, that's great. The people that you work with here, I mean, you're gonna find them in the industry later on, and like you kind of want to foster relationships that you like now because it. I went through a lot of college classes where I didn't really like a lot of the people I worked with because they either skirted by, they weren't exactly. Even sometimes they weren't as they wouldn't put as much time as I would in, which is a little toxic. But other times, uh, they just they wanted to be there because they like games. They didn't necessarily like, like game development. So find people you like to work with as well and start harboring those relationships. Um, a little uh, a little nebulous there at the end, but hopefully some <laughs> ideas come across. Repeat question or? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so basically, I wanted to bring this specific like range of people here because I really wanted to show you guys that there is way more to the industry than just gameplay programmer and 3D artist or animator. There's so many positions and like 
the majority of them aren't even here at this table. Like we have HR specialists, um, we have finance officers, we have like every almost everything you can think of in the game industry. There's like whatever interest you have, I'm sure there's like a position for you. So um, yeah, I I would say like don't try to spend all of your time on something that doesn't genuinely make you happy because whatever niche you have that does excite you naturally as Kurt gets excited, you know, or you get excited, you guys all get excited about your own very niche thing. Everyone has that thing where it doesn't feel like work and I promise you, you can probably find a way to work that into your place in the game industry. So yeah, don't, uh, it, and that's really hard for like a lot of uh, college students to see. When I was in college, I also was an officer in the game design club and everything, and we've talked to other studios, and I still didn't realize the vast like amount of roles there were in the industry until I got to Tripwire. I was like, wow, there's every type of person here from all sorts of backgrounds, and some people have, like don't ever touch games. Some people live and breathe games. Like some people are like. 62 years old. Some people are fresh out of college. There's like, there's. Like, when you said that. But um, yeah, a place for everyone. Don't pigeonhole yourself into something that you don't genuinely get excited about. Is my main piece of advice, you guys. I actually think it's a little funny because. For a gameplay studio, we have no gameplay programmers here. We're all doing other types of programs. So, yeah, I, I specifically was really excited that we came on to represent engineering because we, like, when you think of programming in the game industry, you think of, like, making the character shoot or have special attacks. We don't do that. We don't do we, that. Okay. I no. have done that, but right now I don't. And we, like, we have very niche places in the engineering department. Yeah. and. Um, and uh, going back to a question they had for you was like um, kind of dispelling the myth of like uh, being a 3D artist doesn't mean that you're also creating the characters. You're working with a concept artist that also works with designers that also like there's a whole chain of people and I'm sure like uh, with game jams and stuff you guys have like your own role like artist role and you're doing everything. You're uh, concepting the character, you're modeling, you're texturing, you're rigging, you're animating. In the industry, that is all broken up into individual people. So if you do love doing 3D modeling, but you hate animating or you hate rigging, you can still just focus and put all your eggs into that basket and not worry about the rest and just master your craft and then find your place in the industry with that one thing that you're good at. You know? I actually do. Yeah. No, I'll do. Um, okay. Quick piece of advice that you give to students looking, looking to work in the game industry, setting expectations, list of things we should be doing, loving works. Oh, one thing I want to add for <laughs> expectations. <laughs> Sorry. Expect to move. Uh, uh, getting a job here in Georgia, you might, it's possible. Uh, you probably won't. Be willing to move. San Diego, San Francisco, Austin, across New world. York, cross country. <laughs> if you, It's possible to wave around here for a job. You will make your career a lot quicker and better if you're willing to just, to just move. That's, uh, I, I did it, most people I know did. Michael didn't. <laughs> I know, I know, but the, the expectation is that you probably will need to, and it'll be a lot easier to get a job if you want to. I mean, we hire a lot of people remote now, so like, if you're talented, yeah, you, can work, really you can work, yeah, yeah, you can work, you can work from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Two people that I've hired on my team, one of them is his first job in the industry, he's not the yeah. yeah. The other guy has a move, so. Right, that, that, that advice is expired. <laughs> <laughs> um, good, good. Well, I was going to ask, like, just to, like, know what kind of advice to give. It's, like, I saw a lot of people's hands go up for coding. Like, is there anyone here for, like, arts or visual stuff? Okay. Okay. okay, nice. I just thought maybe everyone was, just, like, coding <laughs> blueprints and stuff like that. Um, I guess just, like, keeping it simple. Just build a portfolio for what you want to do. Um, learn how to work in a team, and then what I did was my first job was a contract role. Um, so it was a one-year contract, and usually people with experience don't want those jobs. And nowadays, those may be the jobs you got to move forward. Um, yeah, and then I got hired on a full-time company.
Uh, biggest thing, don't get discouraged. Um, boy, seriously, I'm, I'm born and raised from Sweden. I moved over to the U.S. to get an education. I work full-time and I live full-time here now, obviously. Uh, and I wanted to make my dream come true. Uh, just don't give up. Be persistent. Passion is huge. Passion is key, in my opinion. Um, just like Sam was saying, but, you know, like holding yourself up and really just pulling in your crap and having fun with it. That's what matters. Um, I really can't express it in any other way because it's like everyone expects things to come at a silver platter, right? Like they're like, oh, now I have my degree now, I'll be able to go in anywhere I want. No, well, it's not really like that. If you're not passionate about it, if you're not driven about it, if you don't want it, you're not going to get it. I'm sorry. This, the world is not that nice. Uh, but if you're passionate about it, if you have a drive for it, if you're willing to just work those extra hours, it shows. People pay attention to them. They want those employees because they are passionate about that themselves. So don't get discouraged. If you get rejected, look for something else. Try again. Try again. And eventually someone's going to find the exact thing that they want from out of you and give you that job and you're going to be so fucking happy. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> but, but, yeah, be passionate. Don't give up. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It's a small industry. We all know each other. But that's all the more reason for you to just be assertive. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to Yeah, so... As as a QA lifer, uh, I know that that's a lot of that that's a that's a um, uh, a department or a position that is one that a lot of people start their careers with. Um, and I would say, um, you know, when I when I started, um, I knew someone who just asked me if I wanted to be a game tester. I think I was delivering furniture at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and then when I got in the industry, I started to take it serious. Um, and so if you're an artist or if you're a, a coder or a programmer um, and that's what you want to do, it's okay to get into the industry like with QA, bring that knowledge with you. Like talk about that if you're interviewing for QA. Talk about like your experiences and what you know. And once you get your foot in the door, um, you know, if, if you're into art, go speak with the artists and kind of, you know, like I, I keep saying it, but like pick up that knowledge from them um, and, and, and make yourself stand out. You know, be a good communicator, um, give like constructive feedback, um, be, be open to, um, to failing um, and, and to learning new things. Um, it is going to be tough. Um, it's definitely a grind, especially in QA. I'm not going to lie to you, it's a, de it's a definite grind, but it will pay off. Um, and always just remember, there's a spot for everyone. So if you don't think you belong, you do. Um, and just use that mentality um, as you go, and, and, and you'll be successful. Yeah, that's so um, OK, Emily? Mine's going to be short. Um, whatever area of game dev you do end up in, stay hungry. Keep reading on uh, new technology, and respond to your pings on Slack or Teams or whatever. Respond to your pings, please. <laughs> Do not be that person. Yeah, I don't want to chase you. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to chase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely that part of good communication on there. I did like a few like shows before where people would come up with their resume on it and you're trying to communicate with them about it and you're like the only one who's talking yeah. on it. Um, hopefully like since you're all part of this club on it, you're getting that opportunity to be able to like really discuss your opinions with people, get in that practice of being in that kind of conversation mode about being able to talk about yourself and disengage in a conversation with other people uh, it is a pretty important thing that sometimes uh, might be forgotten yeah nerves always strike um, in that case you know take some improv classes or something like that <laughs> um, uh, but uh, let's see another one on there is um, I mean, there's always different ways to get back into the industry. So even if you're graduating, like, I really want to go into games on it. Uh, games may not be the first job that you get that goes directly into that goal on it. Uh, I mean, like, 
video games are pretty popular, they're gonna be here for a few more years. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to get like a job at like doing software programming for a banking service or something like that, uh, games will still be there even if you like after a few years there you still have that drive and you're still looking around yes. to get something in the game industry on it. They're still gonna be there. I hope they're still gonna be there. <laughs> I had a lot of my experience in making video games, so I'm hoping that'll be there for a little while longer. I, I wanna fill in on that actually, because that's huge. Like I started off in science. Like I did biology, science, all the rest of it for like six years. <laughs> And I was so so sure that I couldn't make a living living doing what I wanted to do. I was so freaking sure. Everyone else around me was kind of like, oh, but you should. You should try that. I was like, I'm not going to make it. Are you kidding me? But you have, like, even if you have the wrong education, if you, even if you have this degree and you find out later on that, oh, I should, I should try something else. I should have been this specific thing. Don't shoot yourself down. Keep trying anyway. I had the wrong degree. I took intensive classes and to make it up like a, a four year degree to two years instead. Uh, crunched like heck. But it was one of those things that there's no dead end. If you feel like you're at a dead end right now and it, like you're not feeling like you're in the, in the right position, um, don't fret about it. It'll get, it'll, if you have the drive, it'll be fine. <laughs> You'll figure it out. Imposter syndrome is a real deal. Say what? Imposter syndrome is it a is, real deal. It is so real. I was almost going to curse there uh, again. <laughs> and it's also very common, like, despite like how you might feel on it, like, oh, I'm the only one who doesn't feel like they fit in, there's other people who also feel it exactly the same way. Yeah, who, who here knows what imposter syndrome is? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's very common. I can't tell you how many times you think, I can't believe I can pay for this. Yeah? <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> No. Yeah. But that's where the passion comes in. Like, yeah. If you're driven, if you're enjoying what you're doing, it's not going to be a job anymore. It's going to be something that you genuinely enjoy doing and people will happily pay you for it. Because you do a good job. Well, thank you to the panelists. Um, we'll give you guys a round of applause. For